And now I'm going to share my screen with you so that you can see my PowerPoint here. All right. Can everyone see the PowerPoint? This will be fun because now I can't see the chat. OK, I can still let people in. That's great. <laughs> All right. Yes, people can see my PowerPoint. Awesome. All right, so I am going to go ahead and get started with the presentation now. Um, like I said, I'm Allison Zach. I uh, work at the Clifton Institute in Warrington, Virginia. And um, this program was originally um, designed to happen in person <laughs> on our property. Um, of course, that all has changed now. So I'm giving the talk remotely, but I'm hoping that at some point in the future, um, we can have a beaver watching event at Clifton uh, when this whole situation resolves itself, hopefully soon. Um, because of course it would be more fun if we could watch beavers together after uh, hearing me talk about them. So <clears throat> if you're not familiar with the Clifton Institute, um, we are an environmental nonprofit and we do environmental education programs, research in the Northern Virginia Piedmont, and we do habitat restoration projects as well. Um, I'm the education associate at the Clifton Institute, and I'm also a beaver believer. So that is why I'm giving this talk this evening. Um, I'll be talking about the challenges and benefits to coexisting with beavers, um, and then I will be taking questions if you have them. So first things first, advance my slide. Okay, <laughs> first things first, um, happy International Beaver Day. This is a real thing. Um, <laughs> it is April 7th every year, and um, last year I took this picture at the Clifton Institute. I celebrated it with a couple of friends. We were on the upper pond, and um, we, if you're judging me for my drink of choice for Beaver Day, that's fair. <laughs> um, but we sat out on the dock, and sure enough, an adult beaver came and swam over to us around dusk and um, we watched it for about 10 minutes. So it was really neat. Um, like I said, beavers are not a seasonal thing. So whenever we get back up and running with programs out at the Clifton Institute, we're going to do a, um, an in-person beaver watching program. So don't you worry. All right. So a few quick facts about beavers. Um, Oh no, I think there's people in the waiting room. Let me admit everyone here. All right, a few fast facts about beavers. Um, <laughs> I don't know, it was maybe last summer, there was a trending hashtag on Twitter called unscience an animal. And so this image here is unscience a beaver. <laughs> Basically, um, a bunch of scientists took their study animal and pointed out the anatomy of the animal and gave it really funny names. So um, an example for the beaver, those teeth are called mouth hatchet, floaty fur, water whacker for the tail, and small flappers on the feet. Um, <clears throat> and this is actually a really great picture which shows off some of those um, adaptations that beavers have for their semi-aquatic lifestyle. Um, they are in the rodent family. Their Latin name is Castor canadensis. Um, and as you can see from the map up in the corner there, um, in Virginia, they are pretty much everywhere. <laughs> they're widely distributed in our state, and they're also widely distributed throughout the country um, and throughout North America. Um, they are herbivores, so they do only eat plants, over 80 species of vegetation and different parts of those plants, including the bark, the leaves, um, even some flowers and other plant parts. Um, they don't eat fish. That's one of the common misconceptions about beavers. And a typical colony or a little family group consists of between four and 10 individuals. Um, they are, like I said, very well adapted for living life, mostly in the water. Um, they've got those flipper feet um, and the fur that which they were um, almost hunted to extinction for, but it protects them from the water and from the cold. 
um, and those teeth, which of course is how they are chopping down all those trees and eating and building and doing everything that beavers do. Um, they live 10 to 20 years, but closer to 10 to 12 in the wild. And their predators in this area might include coyotes, bobcats, bears, and some of the larger raptors that could get a hold of a, a beaver kit, which is the name for a baby beaver. Um, their current population in North America, <laughs> someone in the 80s estimated between 10 and 20 million beavers. And that's still what people are saying today. So um, we don't know how many beavers, but we do know that they are not a species of concern. And in fact, populations of beavers um, are increasing in lots of places across the country. Um, the beaver population in general is still rebounding from when uh, the height of the fur trade. There is a very similar species called the Eurasian beaver, or the Latin name is castor fiber or castor fever, as the Europeans say. And um, they look very similar to the North American beaver, um, pretty similar behavior too. So that's just a little, another fun fact there. Now I am going to stop here and just see, check the chat if there are any questions. Okay, great. So we're gonna start off with um, the challenges to coexisting with beavers. And it really boils down to just a couple of behaviors um, that beavers have that cause problems for people. And that is flooding and tree chewing. Um, flooding, of course, is no minor problem. Um, it can flood roads, it can damage property, it can affect people's livelihoods, especially if it's agricultural land that's being flooded. Um, so it's no small problem. And a, a especially big one for flooding is the clogging of culverts that run under roads. Um, it's probably the most popular beaver problem is them uh, trying to dam up a culvert basically. And when they do that successfully, the road above it floods. Um, another thing that beavers do that people might not want them to do is chew down certain trees, maybe ornamental trees or fruit trees. Um, so the, you know, we're selective in which trees we like to use and so are the beavers and sometimes there's some overlap there. Um, and then there's also, I think, some cultural challenges with humans and beavers coexisting. I'll draw your attention to the quote at the top of this slide, which says that um, humans simply do not like to be outdone by a rodent. And I really think there's some truth to that. Um, when beavers, oh, someone's coming in here. When beavers block up a culvert, for example, um, they're just trying to understand how people have changed the landscape and then act accordingly in order to survive. Um, and why I'm so fascinated by beavers is because compared to so many other wild animals, they have more agency. Um, from our perspective, beavers destroy the landscapes that we value, um, and they participate in that seemingly like more directly than other species. And so that, coupled with the fact that they're rodents, is why I think it's hard for a lot of people um, to consider non-lethal management options because who wants to be outsmarted by a rodent? <laughs> uh, we've got mice in our homes and rats in our cities and beavers in our backyards. And uh, not only are they there, but they're changing the landscapes and not always in ways that we want them to. Um, so it's a challenge, but it's also pretty incredible. Um, and so how do we manage those challenges? All right, so here are some solutions. Um, the biggest, most effective solution for problems with flooding caused by beavers um, is something called a flow device. So in the picture here, you see this contraption that allows um, water to keep flowing through a culvert, um, but beavers are not able to block it up. So in the very bottom, a little bit to the left hand side of this picture, um, is where the actual culvert is. So the water's going in through a pipe. They also can't, they can't block up either end of that pipe and then water is allowed to uh, flow through the culvert there. Um, it allows beavers to stay on the landscape. So it saves beaver lives. It saves the habitat, that beautiful wetland habitat that's often there in the roadside as well. Um, and it saves money. It saves private landowners money in the long term. It saves cities and states money. Um, if you're interested in the, the 
nitty gritty details of that. I can share some studies with you, but um, hundreds of thousands of dollars have been saved by installing these flow devices, which cost between two and 3,000 to install and then require um, minimal maintenance over time. But the way that um, a lot of people are currently managing this issue is by removing the dam in the culvert or ramming it out, ramming all the debris out, um, and then just basically waiting for a new beaver to show up and do the same thing. Um, because they're trapping, they're lethally trapping the beavers that are there, removing their dam, and then uh, that's just a hole for another beaver to come on in to some nice habitat. Um, so Beaver Deceivers is the beaverdeceivers.com there is a great resource. Skip Lyle, whose photograph this is, I met him um, in person earlier this year and he's the founder of that company and he's been engineering and installing flow devices for many years um, and his website has some great information about that. Um, as far as tree chewing goes, that's a simpler problem to solve in theory. Um, there's two general methods. One is painting a tree with a mixture of sand and latex paint. It just deters the beavers from wanting to chew on that tree. Um, and then the other option is to wrap the trees with um, wire mesh cylinders. The only uh, trick with that is that you have to go high up enough on the tree that the beavers uh, can't reach up and chew above it. That's a, a common mistake that people make, keeping in mind especially that um, when it snows, that raises up <laughs> the platform a little bit if you live somewhere where there's a substantial amount of snow anymore these days. Um, <clears throat> and then culturally, is something that we can all do um, is just talk about beavers in a different way. Um, the term nuisance beaver or nuisance animal in general, um, I think also contributes to um, people finding it more challenging to coexist with these animals. And um, instead, if we talk about the benefits that they provide, um, instead of the problems that they cause for us, I think there can be um, a shift in society just in the way that we view and perceive these animals and their behavior. So that's part of it too. It's a little more of an abstract one for sure. Um, and then the link there, almostanthropology.com is my own personal um, website about um, humans and relationships with nature and wildlife. And I have a page on my website called Human Wildlife Conflict Resources where I compile anytime I find um, a good website or um, a good article, I actually just throw it up on that page and it's divided up by species. So there's a whole beaver section there with other websites that you can refer to. Um, and a quote from Skip Lyle down here at the bottom, he, <laughs> he says that um, the idea that we can't make flow devices work is almost embarrassing. Beavers have a brain the size of a walnut. If we want to, we can beaver proof the freaking world. <laughs> Um, and he is very confident um, that he can he can resolve any beaver conflict non-lethally. So it's possible. Um, you just have to be willing to invest a little bit in the beginning to see those long-term impacts. Um, so what are those benefits? I'm gonna pause for just a second here to make sure that we have no questions in the chat. Okay. Great. Any questions so far? Don't be shy. Um, so what are the benefits of having beavers on the landscape? Um, I've divided this up into benefits from the ponds beavers create, the dams that they build, and then their foraging behavior itself. And um, beaver ponds replenish aquifers and store groundwater on the land, um, which actually mitigates floods. Beavers <laughs> um, can cause floods, but also prevent floods, um, both with their behavior, which is kind of funny. Um, the beaver ponds also help to stabilize the water table and almost, an, in a sense, drought-proof um, a landscape. They also, wet, the wetlands that beavers create can help to slow and even extinguish and stop the spread of wildfires. And of course, this is probably the most obvious one, beavers provide habitat for so many other species, increasing biodiversity in general. Um, even the vegetation that drowns and dies on the initial creation of a beaver pond, um, termed morticulture by one uh, beaver scientist, um, even those dead tree snags provide habitat for cavity nesting birds and other wildlife. Um, beaver ponds create oases, oases, 
whatever the plural of oasis is, <laughs> for migrating waterfowl. Um, beaver dams, so that is of course the structure that the beaver actually builds on a um, fairly small stream to create the pond in the first place. Those dams help to filter sediment and pollutants. They reduce silt and overall just improve the quality of the water. Um, and the beaver dams, especially when they're built kind of in succession, help to restore streams, regulate water flow, um, and reduce erosion in areas where, for example, um, cattle have been overgrazing or causing stream erosion, that sort of thing. Um, and finally, their foraging behavior prevent, promote, sorry, promotes plant growth. Um, so when they forage on the willow stems, for example, new shoots will sp sprout up and that willow will keep growing. All right, next. Oops. All right. I'm going to take this slide, this opportunity, to get a little less scientific for a second. Um, before I knew anything about beavers personally, um, I just enjoyed watching them. I started working at the Clifton Institute and I saw evidence of their presence before I actually ever saw them. Um, and I just enjoyed watching how they changed things and what they did. And I know it's a common tool of conservationists to try and make a species valuable to people so that there are incentives to protect the species, protect their habitat. But to me, I think it's worth saying, um, and I know I'm not the only one who feels this way, beavers are just inherently valuable. Um, we don't need any of the benefits that I listed on the previous slide to be able to appreciate beavers and what they do and just the beaverness for its own sake, right? Um, this slide shows pictures of a couple of crocheted, a crocheted wall hanging that I made with um, a beaver chewed stick at the top and then little beaver chips um, down the side there and then another little craft project that I do with beaver chewed sticks and things. Um, and it's just because I think beavers are great. Um, I watched a documentary called Beaver Believers, which some of you may have seen before, and there was a quote in it that I loved that I wrote down and then lost. <laughs> but I'll paraphrase it. It's, it was basically a woman in the video who said that she loved working with beavers because she loves collaborating with unusual partners. And um, I've never forgotten that quote. And I try to do the same thing in both a creative way, but also in ways that might inspire more beaver appreciation in general. So I also have a, um, I do some beaver appreciation posts on social media. Um, I created a hashtag called thank a beaver. And I just like to tweet pictures of, um, of beaver activity at Clifton, um, along with some of those benefits because um, some people just might not know what good beavers are for, or they may have not seen the type of work that they can do. And so um, I believe that you can't make an informed wildlife management decision without knowing kind of both sides of that story. And um, so I like to do a little bit of outreach on my Twitter there. Um, now let's chat about Clifton beavers. I'm going to pause here and just give a moment for anyone who has a question. Just type it into the chat if you have one. Mm, okay, so there's a question from Amy. Thank you, Amy. Um, her question is, I'm just, I think you all can see it. Why do beavers girdle tree, very large trees? Um, so I don't know the answer to this question. I am happy to look into it for you, um, into the literature, um, because it's a great question. It's not something that I have personally witnessed at the Clifton Institute. Um, I have certainly read up to a certain diameter of tree that beavers prefer because um, once, you know, once they chop it down, they have to carry, <laughs> they have to carry it. They either, they could eat the bark um, as the tree falls, but then of course they're gonna be building with the rest of the material from that tree. And um, if it's too heavy for them to carry, then it was a wasted effort. Um, I don't know, I haven't heard of beavers um, actually girdling a tree and then waiting for it to fall. That is a wonderful question and I am gonna look into that and maybe send out an answer to you guys. So thanks for that question, Amy. Does anyone else have a question? Well, I'm here in the chat. Uh, shivers, 
my cough started happening and also the pressure on my lungs. That's when she started self isolating. Self check her house, keep her um, home, free to contain them. It took a few days to get to your face from her doctor. I can hear someone else on the video here. If you could just make sure that you are muted. Um, here, I'm gonna. Ugh. Okay. All right. So let's get back to um, the Clifton beavers, which are the, it's the population or the little community that I have the most um, the experience with. And so, like I said, when I first started working at the Clifton Institute over a year and a half ago now, maybe, um, the evidence of beavers is what you tend to see first. Um, you might see a dam, you might see a pond or a lodge. And here on the side, there are pictures on the right of two different, um, two different lodges. There are actually a total of five lodges that we have at Clifton. Um, and then a dam on the bottom left-hand corner. Um, they created only one of the ponds themselves. Otherwise, the beavers that live at Clifton utilize the man-made ponds that are already there. And um, on the top left-hand corner, of this slide is an example of a beaver bank den. So they don't always build lodges. And um, all of our lodges at Clifton are also on the bank. We don't have any of the island lodges that you sometimes see. Um, I feel like I see more of those in areas where there are larger predators for beavers, um, things like wolves and maybe grizzly bears um, who would pose more of a predation threat. So. Um, okay, something is coming in the chat here. Ah, Ellen asks, um, if there are a couple of lodges, how can you tell if, oh, sorry, I just mixed up two questions. Ellen asks, with five lodges, do the beavers interact with each other? Ellen, that is a great question that I am actually going to answer in just a minute. <laughs> One of the first questions that popped into my head when I saw all these lodges was, wait, how many beavers are living in these lodges? And are they all in one group or separate groups? And so I'm gonna answer that in just a minute. Thanks for asking. Um, and to your question, are they close together? Um, it's very interesting. We have one lodge that's kind of separate on the pond that they created themselves. And then the other four lodges are in actually two pairs. So two on one pond and two on the other pond, very close together. Something I wanna actually measure. Um, and I'm kind of wondering if they maintain two lodges because they didn't have to dam that pond. Um, but I'm going to be hopefully studying that more in the uh, months to come. So thanks for that question. Um, and then how can you tell if a lodge is active? That's another great question. Um, so the lodge in the photograph on the bottom right is actually not an, uh, an active lodge right now is actually kind of collapsing in on itself. The easiest way to tell is if there's fresh cut stumps in the vicinity of the lodge. Um, and also beavers maintain their lodges pretty um, consistently. So if you, if you get the chance to observe it kind of every day over the course of some time, you'll see new mud and um, very freshly stripped sticks being added to an active lodge. Um, another good way to tell an active lodge in the winter time is if there, if you see evidence of a food cache out in the water near the lodge. So you'll see branches sticking up and that's um, how beavers store food for the winter if, um, in case they happen to get frozen inside of their lodge, if the water, um, if the surface of the water completely freezes. Great questions. Okay, um, let's move on to, um, so how I was going to answer some of these questions. <laughs> Aside from lurking around after work at dusk and <laughs> trying to see the beavers, um, I had also used camera traps before in my research studying monkeys, and there were some camera traps available at the Clifton Institute for me to use. And so we put up cameras in those three different locations. Um, I did have some sense of which lodges were active at given times throughout the year. And so I would target the camera trap work in that one spot where I could tell that they were active. Um, the camera trap in the top right here is the current one that is pointed towards the view right below it. So that's like the, what it looks like every time it takes a picture. Um, and that is one of the beaver lodges. It doesn't quite look like one from that view, but I promise it's there. Um, 
but I first started doing camera trap stuff in March of 2019. Um, I wasn't seeing the beavers very often and I certainly wasn't getting many pictures. I got this one on the bottom left here uh, with some crazy sun stuff going on and not even 100% sure that that's a beaver. Um, and then I got this picture of a moving stick in the middle <laughs> floating through the water and I knew there was a beaver under there pulling the branch, but couldn't be sure. So my initial efforts at beaver camera trapping uh, required some patience. Um, but 27 species um, is so far to, to today the count of um, species that we have photographs of from these different lodges. So just a camera planted at a lodge and there are 26 in addition to the beavers, other species also sharing that habitat. So I'm gonna show you some of those pictures. Um, there were geese, squirrels, turtles, mice. I hope everyone can see these photos. I tried to help you out with little arrows here. I'll run through these pretty fast because they're not beavers. Um, swans, wood duck pair, um, a heron and a muskrat. The heron, the pictures of the heron is even teaching us about what kind of fish live in the pond, which is an accidental discovery that I think is a sunfish there. Um, raccoons, robin, two river otters, and a mink. So um, the two pictures on the bottom of this slide are other um, semi-aquatic or living near the water type mammals that um, we tend to see more in the winter. And all winter at Clifton, we were watching these animals and it was pretty incredible. Um, a coyote, a deer, of course, lots of deer, not just a deer, like hundreds of pictures of deer. Um, lots of songbirds, a bear came by, a rabbit, some children, of course, <laughs> during one of our education programs, um, a turkey, an opossum, and now to the beavers. All right, so um, the camera trap photographs, they look different, of course, when it's like the night vision and during the day, and most of our beaver pictures end up in the night vision mode of the camera. This one is from, as you can see at the top left there, it's from about 5.50 in the morning. It's from this February, um, and it's just a pretty good side profile here of um, an adult beaver. And you can see, um, some wet mud right behind it, which um, is a cool, another cool thing to watch in the camera trap photos, especially the sequences where they're putting down wet mud and new sticks and that sort of thing. Um, here's a daytime photograph. One of the things that other people have been able to do with beaver camera trap pictures is to actually identify individuals based on marks on their tails. Um, I've been keeping my eye out for anything um, kind of distinct about our beavers, but I have not yet found anything, but there's a very wet beaver. This one is carrying a massive <laughs> stick, um, and you can see its front paw there. Again, around 5.30 in the morning, that seems to be around the time when they're most active. Um, beavers are technically crepuscular, so active at dawn and dusk, but uh, we, you know, there's photographs from them at um, 1 a.m. We see them during lunchtime at Clifton, so they can be active at any time. Um, here's another beaver just pulling a giant branch and a huge mouthful. I mean, look at the size of this beaver. That is amazing. Here's another mouthful of some dried vegetation. Now, do you notice anything different about this beaver? Um, I believe that this is a yearling. So um, through through putting up these camera traps and just observing over the course of time, back to answer Ellen's question, we only have one colony or family unit of beavers living. Um, they rotate between those three lodges um, and they're only ever active at, you know, kind of one of the three sites at one time. Um, like I said, two of those lodges are like little pairs of lodges pretty close together to one another. And um, so I believe that this is a yearling beaver, so it was born last 
uh, late spring, early summer. And they do stick around for a couple of years with the family unit. They help maintain the lodge as we are seeing through the pictures. And um, they even help to raise the new kits, which um, we'll start looking for around May. Um, and so that is why there could be, you know, up to 10 beavers, like I said in the one of the first few slides, in one little family unit, which you can understand then why they need multiple lodges to accommodate everyone. Here's two individuals in a photograph and three individuals in a photograph. And this is actually for um, the top corner, top left corner is actually two little beavers side by side there. Um, so we know there are at least four. We have seen four in person. We have seen four in one camera trap photo. And so our best guess of the size of our colony is at least four beavers. Um, we're still learning. So um, I, like I said, this camera actually in the picture you're looking at now is still active at this moment. I just downloaded about 700 new photographs a few days ago. Um, and I'm digitizing the data from the photos, um, reviewing the literature. I don't know some of you, um, if you get our monthly newsletter from the Clifton Institute, um, you already heard about uh, the beaver otter interactions, which I'll share with you in just a minute. <laughs> um, I'm also in the planning stages of a study that looks at the human perceptions of wildlife like beavers and coyotes and some of those um, that are unpopular species. And um, on that note, if you have any stories about managing beavers on your own property, I would love to hear from you. Um, and that's my email address in bold there. And um, Another thing that I just wanted to share with you all is about our young scientists research experience, which is if you know of any middle or high school students that would like to come to the Clifton Institute uh, this summer for a week and help me help me study the beavers. Um, we have an opportunity for our students to do that. Um, they spend a week um, working on their own research question from start to finish research question generating data collection, data analysis. They present their results at the end of the week and it's a really fun experience. And I just have a few of the research questions that I still have about these beavers um, listed underneath there to kind of um, spark. If there's any young scientists out there who wanna join me in that, you know where to find me. All right, do we have any questions? I'm gonna check the chat here. Um, so Amy asks, beavers on the river and never seen a lodge. Um, yeah, so like the bank den that I showed, um, if, you know, if they're able to subsist and the river is maybe wide enough and still shallow enough for them to feel safe without damming it up and making more of a pond, um, they might use a bank den instead. Of course, that involves a lot less energy for them to build. So um, that might be a decision that they're making. And um, you know, beavers do disperse. So the about age two is when all of the old yearlings um, would of course finally get kicked out basically of their um, territory where they were born and they'll have to go find their own territory. So there are like roaming beavers when they are looking for good habitat. So they might be temporarily staying in different spots and just using bank dens in that case. Hope that answers your question, Amy. Um, so let's, oh, this is the, um, something I've been very interested in lately is beavers interacting with other of our semi-aquatic mammals. Um, so we can't be sure of what this is, but I'll tell you what it looks like. This is a blurry otter, um, moving away from the camera at a speed that causes the otter to look blurry. In the next, like a split second later, we have the otter moving further away and then we have a beaver coming up from the bottom right corner of the photograph here. And then the very next picture is of a blurry beaver. And you saw some pictures before of not blurry beavers. So this one is clearly moving faster than usual. Um, we can't say for sure that the, this beaver is chasing an otter, but um, certainly this sequence of these three pictures um, has led me down a quite a fun, um, black hole of literature and interactions between beavers and otters, which most people for a long time used to think that the otters would benefit from the beaver ponds and old lodges to raise their young, um, but it is now um, 
coming out more and more these agonistic interactions between beaver and otters where um, they don't get along so well. And otters may even prey upon young beavers and there have been um, reports of less than like happy communal living there. Um, <clears throat> so as this blurry beaver kind of runs off, waddles off, after the otter into the sunrise here. Um, oops, I didn't mean to switch. Okay, um, anyway, uh, humans have been coexisting with modern day beavers for at least 15,000 years. And so the conclusion of all of this that I wanna share with you all is that um, as development continues and the agricultural sector is responsible for feeding more people with less space, beavers do present challenges for humans um, and very, you know, very valid challenges. Um, but we are coexisting with beavers uh, with more success now, certainly, than we were during the fur trade. And um, I think that if more people understand the benefits of sharing space with beavers, um, we might do even better. So you don't have to call yourself a beaver believer and you don't have to even agree with me that beavers are cuter than otters. You know, some people who would fight me on that, it's quite the rivalry. <laughs> um, but maybe just recognize that these are resilient social creatures who have the ability to alter ecosystems, to create ecosystems just like we do. And if you think about it that way, the beavers are already coexisting with us and that's worthy of our respect. And so um, we can think about how we can better coexist with them. So if you still wanna learn about beavers, this is my slide here of book recommendations. Good quarantine reading here. Um, Eager by Ben Goldfarb, uh, Once They Were Hats by Francis Backhouse and The Beaver Manifesto by Glynis Hood are all great books for adults to read about beavers. And I actually saw the two women authors in the middle here speak at BeaverCon in March and they were wonderful. Um, so I highly recommend all three of these books. And then there is a picture book about skydiving beavers which is actually based on a true story that happened in Idaho, and I don't wanna spoil it for you. So um, check that out too, or just Google it because it's a crazy story. Um, also another fun quarantine activity. Um, this is something that I took from Ben Goldfarb, the author of that book, Eager. He posted a video on YouTube last week or the week before called The Damn It, Why Beavers Matter. And um, he suggested this really great activity uh, for kids, maybe in a you know, homeschooling scenario, um, to hop on Google Earth and actually look for beaver features on the landscape. Um, and so I just um, screenshotted this picture here of, um, it's from a national park in Minnesota where I know there's lots of beaver activity. And um, I just looked for, you can see a series of some dams and ponds here. You can even zoom in and look for lodges, which might be those structures in the middle of the, each little pond there. You can look for the channels that beavers are digging um, as they exploit the trees right around the water's edge. They dig channels to reach further and further um, for more resources. So a fun activity. And I um, like to end on a light note. This is my favorite quote, one of my favorite quotes from Eager. Perhaps the only immutable law in beaver restoration is this. If you let children choose names, Justin Beaver will always win. <laughs> and this is my final slide. Just appeared on my Facebook today in a group of a bunch of beaver lovers. Um, everyone be safe. I'm gonna check the chat right now because I think there are maybe a couple of questions coming in. Oh no, okay. Um, is there a beaver leader? What is their social hierarchy? And um, do adults, do all adults help to build the lodge? This is a great question. Um, so their social structure is a monogamous, relatively mating pair, a mated pair of male and female beavers, um, which look absolutely the same. Um, they're not sexually dimorphic. And um, they both engage in um, all of the behaviors that beavers engage in. Um, so in that sense, there is not a single leader, uh, but rather it's that um, pair of adults and then all of their offspring from either between one and one, one and two years offspring usually in the same lodge. Um, and adult, all the adults help to build um, and even the yearlings 
um, and the, the kids will, you know, they'll learn those skills as they grow up um, and help contribute to that um, as long as they're still with that family group as well. Um, it's a team effort for sure. It's a family team effort. Um, they do, uh, mate for life is like one of those phrases um, that scares scientists nowadays, but yes, kind of. Um, of course, if something happens to one of the pair, uh, a female beaver is more likely to kind of stay and wait for a wandering male. And a male beaver who loses a female partner will um, is more likely to roam around and look for a female. So there is a little bit of a difference in how they disperse and when and why. Um, so thanks for those great questions, Jean. Um, does anyone else have a question? Thank you so much for tuning in. Like I said, please keep an eye on the Clifton Institute Facebook page. Um, we are going to be beaver watching at some point in person, uh, hopefully soon. And um, again, I'm Allison. Uh, my email is azak at cliftoninstitute.org if you think of any more questions. And um, this um, recording will be available to everyone who registered. So if you know someone who missed it, um, I will be hopefully with no technical difficulties be emailing that out to everyone soon. So thanks so much for tuning in. I'll be here for a second if anyone else has questions, but you all are welcome now to leave the meeting and enjoy the rest of your night. Bye.